Hello, hello ladies and gentlemen, and good morning, how the Dutch people would say. Uh, my name is Lukas Haske, and I'm from J. Morita Europe. And we from Morita, thank you all very much for coming here on the last day of this very nice event so far. And so, yeah, thank you, or how the Japanese would say, Arigato gozaimasu, for joining our sponsor session. I am glad to present Professor Rasperini, Giulio Rasperini from the University in Milan, and we are one of the best in his field, an artist in his field. And yeah, I'm very much looking forward to the sponsor session called Abium Yak Laser versus Erythritol Powder Airflow and Surgical Treatment of Periimplantitis. So big, please give it a big hand for Professor Rasperini. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lucas, and uh, thank you, Morita, for inviting me here. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, it, actually, uh, Morita is a wonderful company, I have to say, in, uh, in dentistry in general. I don't know how many of you know that if we have the dental chairs that we have today, is thanks to Morita. It's the first company who developed the possibility for the chairs to bend down. Before, the chairs were, can only go up and down, and the dentists were working in standing. Uh, thanks to the Morita company in 1963, they did the first dental chair that could bend, uh, and now we can work set in a much better position. And beside that, uh, they work very strongly uh, with uh, endodontic instruments and uh, radiography. And I mean, if they do something, like my son Tommaso says, when Japanese do something, it's always first level. So I, I really respect uh, Japanese people in general and Morita in particular because they have a very, very uh, strong uh, methodology and process in thinking uh, forward in, in new methodology. Beside that, uh, we, and um, unfortunately I will not show you the results of this study, but I will show you the process, the thinking that we had to design this study and why we design a study like this. And um, I have to say uh, I have no conflict of interest beside the fact that the Morita company gave us to some of us as, as a opinion leader uh, this um, uh, laser for uh, research purpose. So I, I uh, have in my office one of these uh, instruments uh, for for running research. This is the only conflict of interest that I have, and I have no payment here. And um, what we are talking about is this type of disease. This is a very bad disease that nowadays is uh, very frequent, as have you, we have seen in the previous section where I was uh, just uh, 15 minutes ago in, in, the, main, in the main room. Uh, we know that periplantitis is a real nightmare for nowadays uh, practice. We, to prevent this, we know we should treat periodontal disease first. We have to teach the patient to clean properly. We have to tell to the patient to quit smoking. We need to treat uh, patients with implants in, in a way that they will be successful. But if they will be successful with implants, they will be successful also with natural dentition. So they don't need implants, right? So usually the patient that needs implants are a patient that neglected the natural dentition. And that's why they, they need implants. But implants will not be more successful than the natural dentition. So as long as we can, we try to keep the natural dentition. But when we face an intrabony defect in uh, natural dentition, we know exactly how to treat. We have gold standards. We have evidence, we have a bunch of randomized controlled clinical trials. This is the highest level of the evidence to tell us how to treat this type of defect. We don't have this in periplantitis. What's the gold standard of treatment for periplantitis? We don't know. Why? Because we have a lot of literature reviews and we have very limited number of studies that explain this. And uh, beside that, when we have exposed this area, also the anatomy is completely different. We don't have the apical area that is protected by plaque, uh, that is saved by the plaque as being shown uh, in, in, the 90, in the 70s. But um, 
the plaque will arrive down to, to the bone, basically. And so we need to decontaminate this surface. If you want to maintain this dentition and the soft tissue healthy around, that means we need to remove all the, the, the biofilm and to make this uh, surface biocompatible again, with uh, compatible with healthy tissue uh, uh, and uh, compatible to uh, health in the oral mouth. So as we see, this is not easy. As we diagnose per, uh, perimplantitis, we know according to the uh, last uh, uh, evidence and papers that we should have, it's better I stay this way. I, I used to walk a lot, but it's better I stay this side of the, of the room. And, and um, they, they should have a pocket depth of six millimeter, but this is not alone. If it probes six millimeter can be normal, can be that probes six millimeter. But, uh, uh, they should be associated to the probing depth, uh, bleeding on probing, and or uh, suppuration on probing. And not only on probing, also pressing a finger around the tooth, you can see some pus coming out from the sulcus. And um, uh, these need to be associated with the evidence, radiographic evidence and uh, of bone loss. And uh, this, is in particularly, is a case uh, of Alfonso Coscarella that is here, and I will show you uh, because I have to tell you, I don't like to show, and in general, I don't like presentation when you see one photo like this, and then you don't see the result. I always, when I show something, I like to show, uh, you will see the result later. And this is a case from Alfonso. And uh, we know in the years, we had many reviews that review all the papers, and they came back to give us uh, some statements. And we know that systematic reviews and meta-analysis from Lee and uh, Rakic says that uh, the percentage of implants, this is about the prevalence of this disease, between, like, let's say, the 10 and the 13 percent of the implants have perimplantitis, and between 18 and 20 percent of the patients have perimplantitis. This is what uh, uh, has been found uh, uh, in, in, uh, in nowadays uh, studies. And uh, in this uh, study from uh, this year, from 2018, in this cross-sessional study, out of uh, 149 patients and 490 implants were analyzed, we, uh, don't take my vodka. <laughs> <laughs> no, sake, sake, because it's a, it's a Japanese session. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Between, between the 9% of implants and the, again, the 19% of patients. So there seems to be agreement with, it, with uh, authors recently uh, to detect uh, prevalence of uh, uh, preimplantitis around uh, implants and patients in uh, uh, everyday practice. So to treat preimplantitis, what should we do? We, we need some precondition. We need, as we've been saying before, we need to uh, recreate a sterile implant surface like when we open the brand new implant out of the packaging and we place, insert into the mouth of the patient. We are so careful, doesn't need to touch saliva, need to be perfectly done. We open it at the very last moment. It should be like this. This surface of the implant should be the one that will create OS integration. So we need these implants that were contaminated, we need to make them as clean as uh, they were brand new. And this is not easy because the implant surface, especially the, the recent implants in the, in the last 20 years, we developed these uh, rough surface implants, uh, almost all of them on the market are like this. Uh, of course, it's easier for the plaque to contaminate, it's more difficult for us to decontaminate this surface into, into each niche of the rough surface. And uh, can you think about cleaning perfectly a surface of a rough implant in like distal to the tooth number seven in the lower jaw? Even if you raise a flap, it's bleeding, there is saliva, you can't see distal, and you have to clean between the threads perfectly to make this surface perfectly biocompatible again. This is not an easy job. And um, 
the treatment should not uh, uh, destroy the implant itself. And uh, uh, so we should respect the uh, anatomy, the shape of the implants, the macro design of the implants. And the treatment should not produce high temperature. Otherwise, we have the risk to lose the OS integration or the OS integrated part if it overeats. And the treatment should not leave any foreign debris. For example, if, if you use the burr, the drill, to make the implant surface more smooth, all these particles will go around with biofilm and particles around, and they will stay into the soft tissue. And then you suture inside, and that will be over there. Uh, we need to be sure that everything is removed. Uh, this is not there. And so we should, uh, the treatment area must be visible during the treatment. And that's why, for example, in our design, we decided to make an, an open flap and two flaps, not only buccal, but also lingual, in a way that we want to see 360 degrees the uh, surface of the implants. And um, all uh, materials and tissue that could cause inflammation should be completely removed carefully. So it's not a procedure that we take like, okay, we have a pre-implantitis case, like they'll fix 30 minutes appointment. This, this is a, a serious appointment. And um, I don't know how you feel about that, but uh, most of the time, we have to be honest, we treat our own pre-implantitis. Uh, sometimes we have referred cases, but most of the time we treat our own cases. So these are our patients. They already paid us for the implant treatment. They paid us for the crown placement, and now they face a problem, and we have to fix the problem. The patient feels like, my tooth is my tooth, but the implant is your implant, <laughs> right? And I always say, no, you paid, so this is your implant. <laughs> it's not mine anymore. This is your, and this is your mouth, so you don't clean as I tell you to do, but sometimes we cannot always uh, give all the uh, reason of the preimplantitis to the patient. Sometimes it's our fault. It's about the, uh, the prosthetic design, the emergency profile design. Sometimes in my own cases, I found some cement. I always, when I cemented the crown, I tried on cement to make screw retaining. But every time I cement the crowns, I put uh, some Vaseline, in the, in, the in, in the area around the crown, in a way that the cement will not stay. Uh, I always am very careful in removing with the floss, with the knot. I go with the, with the probe and with the curettes. But sometimes, I have to tell you, I have found some cement on my own cases that I cemented. So that makes me scary about that. That's why I try always to make screw retaining. And uh, so, and this material should be removed. So the, what we know, we, we don't have a gold standard, but we have some techniques that has been published. And each one has some good cases. With each technique, you see some good cases. But no one is uh, uh, reproducible. And uh, we know that we can uh, make surface uh, planning, but this will damage the surface of the implant. We can make uh, iris scaler, and this will, again, damage the surface of the implant. We have ultrasonic scalers we can use. Uh, we know that with the plastic ones, it helps, but some particles of the plastic, like, for example, the plastic curettes, uh, have been found to have some plastic material on the implant surface. So basically, you know, I'm from Piacenza, very close to Parma. We have Parmesan cheese. Uh, you know Parmesan cheese, you grain like this. With the plastic curette, basically you do the same, like grain some uh, uh, plastic uh, curettes on, on the surface of the implants that will remain there. And there is air abrasion, and there is chemical disinfection, which is good, but uh, leaves the contaminated material intact. I mean, it's the, the bacteria will be dead, but they will still be there. And uh, the, the laser that are not uh, erbium laser, uh, like uh, CO2 and um, uh, diodime laser, uh, they will have excess eating and uh, sparking. And uh, about Morita laser technology, because not all the lasers are this, the same, uh, we know uh, uh, they have a very good experience and is uh, several years they're working in the field. 
And this is the third generation of, uh, uh, there, is a, there has been a growing a learning curve. And this is the third generation of uh, uh, laser that we have now, this with the EVO. And um, we know that we have some type of lasers uh, like neodymium, CO2, and the diode laser, which are uh, uh, mostly designed for uh, soft tissues and uh, other uh, lasers that are more uh, adapted to hard tissue. And uh, we have uh, this laser per particularly that is good for the combination of the two. We can use it for both, for the soft tissue and for the hard tissue. <laughs> and uh, we know that the water absorption is very important and is highly effective for soft tissue and hard tissue. And the erbium laser is uh, absorbing water and is uh, the best compared to the other type of lasers. And as you can see from this peak, and uh, you can have a, a slow motion uh, video of how this happens. It's like uh, really bombing the area. And uh, again, the laser and the advantages of erbium laser for dentistry is for the soft tissue, is uh, doesn't uh, carbonize uh, like, like does, for example, the uh, CO2 laser. Uh, it will carbonize the surface and uh, it doesn't create any heat and this doesn't damage and this is uh, when we compare other lasers like diode and uh, neodymium laser so you will have will will lead to a better healing and for our tissues there is no penetration and so there is no penetration in the deep layers and uh, like does for example the erbium and diode laser they will penetrate more into the tissue. And there is no carbonization with the hard tissue. And this is uh, much better compared to the CO2 laser. And doesn't eat up. And the other lasers will do. And so, for example, this beside, uh, uh, we are focused on uh, the treatment of perimplantitis. But beside perimplantitis, that makes this uh, laser very versatile. Uh, we can use, uh, for example, for endo and for also to uh, treatment of caries as well. And if we compare, this is a liver of a pig. This is a pig liver. And uh, as, as you see, if you use a diode laser, we will have uh, carbonization, especially with the CO2 and neodymium as well. And this is what happens with when we use erbium laser. And uh, maybe when you work, you like, for example, when you cut like a frenulum, you like the fact that there is carbonization, so you have zero bleeding. With uh, erbium laser, you still have the bleeding because it's a very gentle cut and uh, it's like to use the scalpel basically and it's still bleed, but you can uh, use the tip in a different way to have the coagulization of the, of the area. And this, this is the wound that you create uh, using the erbium YAG laser. And uh, what happens on the hard tissues, uh, which makes uh, peculiar the area, and uh, that uh, the, the technique is that uh, it will create uh, vaporization. It doesn't carbonize, but will, uh, you see, the tissue just vaporize. And this is good because the biofilm, you, you, you don't remove the particles that they remain in the area. The, the, the biofilm and the thin layer of titanium is just ev evaporate, so disappear completely. So this makes the very interesting. But the fact that we have the possibility to add water makes it even better. And that's why with the water, this is what you see on the surface. And so this makes uh, the technique uh, very nice and keeping the, all, all the procedure cool. And uh, this is the ether. This, when you see red, you see, this is the scale of the degrees. And uh, when you use the CO2 laser after t 10 seconds, this is what happens. If you have a neodymium laser uh, after 20 seconds, this is how it appears. And you will lose also integration in, in this way. Uh, so you cannot use, actually, on, on the implant surface. This is what happens with the erbium laser. You see when you're working, 
it never goes it. And so this is why this procedure is adapted to treat perimplantitis and to treat the surface of the implant. And uh, you see, never get red. And uh, moreover, the, this, uh, this tool has a very peculiar tips, uh, and some are uh, uh, new. And, uh, and this is a new unique uh, advantage because in the external area of this tube, you have the air, a little bit more internal, you have the water that will create a spray on the uh, surface. That's why you shouldn't insert this area into the sulcus because you have risk to create emphysema. That should stay out and you can choose how much water to use, how much air to use to avoid uh, uh, the air, for example, in some areas, uh, etc. And so these are different shape of tips with different indication and that can be used for different things like peri pockets, uh, surgical, heart tissue, root surface. And uh, you see there are 20 different type of tips, very, uh, very useful for any type of treatment that you have. Um, and this is the new tip, the R600T. And these are small videos about, uh, you see, how you can use this tip parallel to the root surface. You don't need to work uh, pointing the surface. It works also lateral. And as you can see in this, in this video, I mean, working parallel to the root surface, uh, implant surface, you will be able to remove the calculus. So this is a big advantage in the distal area, in the more difficult area uh, to reach. Even though we try to use the, uh, the probe in a way, and me at least, that I try to use the point of, of the laser. But th this, this tip is made in a way that you can use uh, in this way, like uh, parallel to the surface. But you see, it's not magic. Doesn't mean that you go two seconds with the laser and it's done. You still, you have to work very hard. You need to use loops. You need to see what you do exactly. And this is not magic. Uh, there are some people that have good cases. Other people have not good cases. But I want to see how much time spend the good people and how much time spend the, the not good tip, people. You know? That's why also when we have studies, we need to have studies from different uh, centers. Yeah. The erbium, the erbium laser does. Yeah. I will show you in the very end, uh, uh, for example, some uh, implant surface, like for example, the T-Unite, will change the morphology because the, the, the more external layer will be completely vaporized and you will see the difference of the surface after you go with the laser. This one does. So after we have seen this and all the quality of this laser, we ask ourselves, I mean me, I say, what do we know? Well, it should be, should be, the, should be the, the, the king of the treatment of laser, right? So as a professor of periodontology, I work with students, etc. I go, first thing I do, I go on PubMed, right? We go on PubMed. Now kids, they check literature on uh, Google. Do you know that? <laughs> they don't go on PubMed. They, they, they look for Google. But uh, I go on PubMed. And on PubMed, I can put uh, perimplantitis laser. And then I click clinical trials. Because this is what I want to see. To evaluate the efficacy of a technique, you need to evaluate a randomized controlled clinical trial. And, uh, and you see only 15 items, only 15. And you will see at the end why we have only uh, 15 items. So the first paper I want to show you is this paper from uh, Schwarz group uh, from Germany. Uh, it's a very good group. And they published in uh, JCP uh, 2013, this four years follow up. And uh, they randomized the use of uh, uh, erbium laser uh, versus uh, plastic curettes and uh, um, cotton pellet with uh, uh, saline solution uh, as a control to, to see the result. And after f uh, four years, they say 
we, there was no benefit. I mean, the test of control was the same. So this is one group that does this procedure. And this is the uh, four years result. So what they did, they did a flap. It's not very clearly described, the type of flap, but it's, it's, it's a flap that is done. And supercrystal, all the uh, implant that is over the supraboni has been uh, uh, prepared with a, with a drill. Uh, so it's made smooth. Then they randomized. They treated the intra bony component with erbium laser or with plastic curettes and cotton pellets and so they, they grafted both cases, and the outcome was to evaluate the bleeding on probing and the attachment level. They found no difference, and uh, interestingly, there are some words in English that they cannot say, but uh, it was interesting to see that uh, this group, uh, they did this study, is one study, and they published the outcome after six months on JCP, and they had 32 patients. That the same group of the same study, they published the outcome after two years, and there are 20 uh, patients, and after four years, so they've lost 12 patients in these two years, and they've lost three other patients in the consecutive two years. So that's basically one study published three times in different endpoints, let's say. But in the literature review, this counts like three papers, okay? Because it's three papers, but it's one study. So the bias, everybody has a bias in the study. When I publish a new technique, I can't wait to have someone else can, can do the same study and having the same results. Because until you don't have the confirmation of what you have done, maybe you are not good in user laser, maybe you are not good in, you know, in to use the plastic curette, I don't know, but it should be something controlled by another group. And then uh, the control side is like this, and uh, we had significant dropout. Now, there is another group that published, because we have so few randomized control clinical trials. And uh, so we, in this other study from the group uh, of uh, Salvi and Skulian, uh, they used the diode laser. And again, was a, a surgical uh, area, and was uh, uh, the, the therapy was the laser. Uh, this was diode laser, so it's a different type of laser. It's a diode laser where they did, uh, uh, there was no flap, so it's non-surgical. Uh, titanium plus uh, glycine eye polishing before. Then they did uh, treatment photodynamic therapy with diode laser for 10 seconds. And in the control side, they use uh, uh, local an uh, antibiotics. And the time point were three, six, nine, 12 months. Fortunately, they made only one paper, so uh, that, that's it. You know, that uh, in the same paper, there are the four end point. And the outcome was the bleeding on probing uh, PD, CAL, REC, and bacterial counts, and biomarkers as well. And basically, they found that no difference between the two approaches, and the number of patients were 40, so it's a good number of patients. And uh, uh, the outcomes were slightly positive versus laser compared to, but statistically, there was no difference. And uh, these are the, this is also interesting because we have uh, two papers for this group. This is the group of uh, Stefan Renwert uh, from Sweden. And uh, in basically, they published this study. And this is an erbium laser again. And uh, it's an erbium laser versus, uh, uh, as a control, uh, is, you see, 42 patients. 42 patients, and they used the erbium laser versus air abrasive uh, device method to decontaminate the road surface. So it's, it's, a, it's a good control, what I would use for, for my study as well. But this is non-surgical, and um, uh, so you don't open. Do you remember when, if you don't open, how can you decontaminate this area properly if you don't see, you know? It's difficult to do what you see when you don't see, it's even worse. Interestingly, Again, <laughs> this is a non-flap uh, surgery, erbium laser versus abrasive device. The outcome is at six months, 
and is a microbiological uh, and X-rays evaluation. And they found uh, no difference. Uh, both failed because there was a slightly better uh, improvement with uh, the laser, but there was basically no uh, difference between the two groups. The same group, simultaneously, because this is in the same period of the year, published another study, let's say published another paper, but out of the same pool of patients. It's not reported in the papers, but if you read the two papers, you understand it's the same, because this is 21 subjects in each group, means it's 42, like the case before. And the technique is exactly the same. So, but the first paper, the outcome was the analysis of uh, the microbiological analysis. And in this paper is a clinical outcome that is pointed out. So the clinical treatment uh, is, uh, is, uh, is the aim uh, of this study. And uh, Schwarz did another study, uh, again, with uh, uh, erbium laser in a non-surgical field. And this is in 2006, where, again, in this randomized control clinical trial, it didn't found uh, the, uh, a good, even if there was a significant reduction in terms of bleeding on probing at six months using the erbium la laser and versus the plastic curette and chlorexidine. In this case, they added the chlorexidine. So at the end of all this story, what do we know? We know basically that we have one study on erbium laser in surgical. And this is the one done by Schwarz that is being published three times. No, not that they, he didn't, he did properly. I mean, he did three papers, one study with three different timing of this study. And then there are two studies with erbium laser non-surgical, one from Schwarz and two papers out of the group of Revert, but it's one. But what is interesting, at the end, if you go on PubMed, all we know about laser, if you look at the type of design of the study, it's randomized control, this is what all we have. But if you go on PubMed and you put perimplantitis laser and then you ask for review, you have like 42. <laughs> Come on, guys, let's design some study and stop to do reviews on three studies. There are three studies, <laughs> and we continue to publish reviews. Okay, stop to do reviews and do study. But it takes more time to do studies than to do review. And uh, also in this very good study from my friend Aoki, I don't know if it's here now, uh, is, uh, is uh, probably the expert in the field, and um, they say there is more, and almost all the systematic literature review in the conclusion is, don't do the review and do more studies. So <laughs> do more studies, right? So the, the, we need more evidence-based studies need to be performed to support the integration, et cetera. Actually, laser has a lot of studies, but they're not randomized controlled, so we cannot use for the systematic reviews. And uh, going into the papers in the review, I was seeing these cases, for example, from Dr. Yamamoto, and uh, he's, he's a hero in the laser field, and he published together with Nevins on the International Journal of Presenter Restorative Dentistry, and uh, with his group of work, uh, this case, for example, uh, where the, a patient, 81 years old, showed a very significant perimplantitis that go epically to the apex, as you can see. And after two years post-op, and after three years post-op, you can see, and the, this is the uh, photos of the procedure that has been done. So the flap was open, and uh, remove all the granulation. Interestingly, also the granulation tissue is removed thanks to the laser. Before you work on the granulation tissue, and after you decontaminate, I will show you later. And this is the case uh, from uh, Yamamoto. Uh, the soft tissue removed with the laser, and this is the three months later, before and three months later, and uh, I think it's three years later. This is the first case that I did when I received the laser, and I was uh, curious, and I had this patient, she's one of my patients. She has this first implant that is successful, but this second implant that I placed much later, 
had uh, perimplantitis. And as you can see from the x-rays, and there was some, the patient had some pain, and pressing there is some pus coming out, and probing depth. So I raised the flap, I cleaned the uh, surface, and uh, uh, then I decontaminate the implant surface with the laser. Then I placed the, yeah? Yeah, looks a little bit different. It's a little bit more opaque, let's say. This is how it looks. When you go with the, uh, with the laser on the implant surface, it turns a little bit more white. It, uh, you see where you were, uh, uh, from where you were or not. And this is the um, graft. Uh, this is BIOS collagen and that I placed with the, with the bioguide membrane. I wanted to respect the two mesial and distal papilla in this flap design because this is another implant. I don't want to elevate this flap with the risk to lose this papilla. We have this papilla we try to preserve. So I work it under the papilla, try to protect the blood vessels there. And this is the suture. It's not super elegant. I could do better, but the patient after two years looks like this. She's pretty happy, and I'm like, Phew. <laughs> because you know, when you have periplantitis in a molar, okay, you can also have a two millimeter of recession. If you see some metal, it's fine. But here in the central, if you see that, you have to remove the implants <coughs> and to start for the, to augment the bone and to start from the beginning. And uh, so she's fine. It's a little bit longer, but it's, it's okay with her. And this is the X-ray. And I think it's pretty significant, but this is just a case report. It's not published. I mean, it's just, one of my cases that I have in the office. So when I approach a new technique, I always am very, you know, I go one step at a time, you know, and I do one case, two case, then I wait, I see, and then I become more confident. And um, talking with my friend, Alfonso, he said, oh, Giulio, I have, I also treated a case, and I did this case in this manner. As you can see, this is his patient. Alfonso is here, he, he could explain as well. Uh, you see he's used a plastic curette, uh, sorry, a plastic uh, probe. Uh, you see it's a significant probing and bleeding on probing. And he removed, he was able to remove the, uh, the crown and the abutment. And so he raised this flap. And as you can see, he's removing the granulation tissue with the laser. And then after removing the granulation tissue, he removed the calculus and, uh, and, and the plaque and the biofilm uh, with the surface, again, with the laser. And this is, at the end, when it's the surface is decontaminated, he uh, placed the, the BIOS collagen again. The bioguide membrane need to be stabilized with a pin. And uh, this is the x-rays at the end of the surgery. And he was able to close, you can't do with in all cases. Some implants, you cannot remove the crown, or some cases uh, are like uh, tissue level, for example, so you cannot completely cover the, uh, the case with your implant. And some other patient just, they don't allow you to, to go without the tooth. Uh, depends which area are you working. But this is interesting to see the x-rays before, at the time of the surgery, two months after, and 10 months after. Uh, it, it seems to be pretty good with a good improvement and all the clinical signs improve. There is a little recession, but in this area of the mouth is acceptable. And it could, anyway, if the patient complains about that, he can still change the abutment and to make uh, everything white. But uh, you see the probing depth improved significantly as well as the x-rays looks a significant improvement. So we were on the same side. And so we both had the same uh, laser and approaching the same technique. So we agreed to design with the company to design this. Uh, uh, and we say that we don't have enough uh, randomized control clinical trial. So let's design one. And so we designed this with the aim to evaluate the efficacy of the Erbium YAG laser on implant surface treatment and uh, uh, for perimplantitis. So the inclusion criteria is, of course, the patient that below 18, they don't have implants in, in our uh, clinic. So uh, smokers and non-smokers, because we want to evaluate the smoker. That will make a little bit more complicated 
the randomization because we need to balance the smoker. We don't uh, want to have one group with all the smokers and the other group without the smoker. So we need, during the randomization, if the patient is a smoker or no smoker, we go in a way that will be balanced. And uh, the, uh, should be diagnosed for preimplantitis. The exclusion criteria is a systemic disease that can influence the outcome and pharmacological therapy and pregnancy. And we designed the study following the consort uh, guidelines uh, that gives us the possibility to follow uh, like a checklist to, to process in a proper way for a randomized control clinical trial. Uh, we asked it to the biostatistician, to, uh, which is, his name is Consonni. This, this guy is amazing. He's a biostatistician that works in my university in Milano. Uh, if you go on, uh, I don't know if you are on ResearchGate on these things, he has a higher uh, citation and than, than Klaus Lang, Jan Linde. He has more than them. And he's young. But he's, as a biostatistician, he works for basically all the university. So his name is uh, all the papers <laughs> of the university. So he has a large number that is super good. And he did the power uh, calculation for us. And I love him because every time I go to him, and I say, look, but this is statistically significant. And he says, Giulio, tell me, is clinically relevant? Because this is more important. You know, statistics is statistics. But you need to treat patients, and you need to know if clinically makes sense. So I love to work with this guy. By the way, he did the uh, statistical power calculation, and we went to the IRB of the University of Milano. And after uh, we uh, are in the process to record this on the clinicaltrial.gov uh, uh, to have the, uh, the, the study registered. So the power calculation say we need to treat 40 patients. So me and Alfonso, we have to treat 20 patients each. And as you know, it's not easy to involve a patient in a study because he needs to know, uh, he needs to sign that he agree with the study. What does it mean? It means that this doesn't pay the therapy. It means that you make the therapy for free, basically, for them. That means uh, that um, uh, he accept to be randomized. We don't know. We are blind. We don't know if we will use laser or if we will use another technique. So we have to explain all the study. He needs to sign, and he can quit the study in any moment he wants. Uh, when he signs the consent form, should, shouldn't be signed in the chair in that moment with a doctor watching him. Okay, but this can influence. You should give him the paper. He can take it at home to read carefully together with his wife or, let's say, think about that. And then the next day or the next week, he comes with the signed paper. This is very important. And um, so in the first phase, let's say, we have to find the patient with perimplantitis. And if the patient accept uh, and uh, to be into the study, we go to the phase two. And so we will uh, uh, give to our uh, monitor, which is uh, Eleonora Rossi. Are you here, Eleonora? Ciao. <laughs> she's, uh, uh, she's our monitor, and she was with me at the university. Uh, she's the one who received the email that uh, we send, and we say, okay, we, I have a patient, and the patient uh, smoke or doesn't smoke, and that's this. And she will tell her, okay, open the envelope, one, two, three, four, and according to, to balancing the smokers. And, um, uh, okay, and we, uh, sorry, I forgot to tell you this. And we choose as a control to, um, to clean the surface of the implant as better as possible with the tools that we know. And then we uh, clean, finally, the implant surface with uh, erythritol powder eye flow, okay? This is to try to remove the biofilm from the uh, rough surfaces of the implant. And uh, so basically what we do is we open two uh, full thickness flap, one buccal and one lingual, and we open the randomization envelope during surgery. Okay, we raise the flap. Now, we open the envelope. We open the envelope, and if it's a test group, what we will do is that we will debride the defect and the implants, uh, cleaning with the, this laser here, okay? 
and this is an erbium laser, and we will use these tips, the PS600T, in case we have uh, granulation tissue, and believe me, you always have 100% granulation tissue. And uh, the other uh, tip, the R600T, uh, we will use to treat the implant surface, the one you have seen before in the video. And this is the setting of the machine, but it's, it's good because you can uh, uh, pre-setting. So you just press a button, basically, and uh, you know exactly what to do very quickly. And, but you will use uh, uh, water in both cases with the both tips. And, uh, but when you use on the road surface, you use without air. You use with water, but without air. And uh, in the case, it's a control group. We debride the defect with the curettes, as we do usually, like in perio, okay? We remove all the granulation tissue. And uh, this takes time, you know, it takes time. And, uh, and we clean the implant surface with a titanium brush. I will show you both cases as example. And at the end, we will use the airflow of erythritol powder to treat the implant surface. And then, in both cases, uh, we will applicate uh, the BIOS collagen from Geislick into the defect, and we will protect with the BioGuide compressed membrane, uh, stabilizing the membrane and the graft uh, and the wound with uh, uh, and the cloth inside, that is the real key, <laughs> uh, with the pins, and we will suture with monofilament. Then in the phase three, we will have different time point, uh, three months, six months, and 12 months and the data collection are the pocket depth, bleeding on probing, and th this is done from a, a blind uh, um, measure that has been calibrated, uh, so it doesn't know the technique that has been used, so it will, it will not know, and the, uh, we will take the x-rays. So the study design, and this is the reason why we have so many literature review, because you open your laptop, you are sitting in your chair in the waiting room, okay, of the, I don't know, of the airport, you open your laptop, you are connected to internet, you do your literature review. Uh, it's not that easy. But let's say if, if you are a student, hard worker, in one, two months, you can finalize a good literature review if you work hard. To design a randomized control clinical trials, we had a meeting last spring as we agreed on the everything and we went into the process of to have the contact with the company, to uh, uh, submit, the, to contact the biostatistician, to submit the, the, the protocol to the IRB, to the ethical board of the university, to have the approval, and to start uh, to have all everything setting, start to enroll the patient, the patient accept. We basically start the first patients, we were in March 2018, and then we set the this time to do the patient enrollments, and then we will finalize because, you know, in Italy, everyone in August is on vacation, so uh, we also, uh, and uh, I will work actually traveling around, but I uh, will not see patients because the patient, they don't come. If you tell them, come the 15th of August, come on, we are at the seaside, we don't come. So we have this period that we cannot actually work, so we, uh, we will finalize the surgery, in November 2018, and then that means that we will have the final results November 2019. This is how long it takes to design a randomized control clinical trial to have a one-year uh, outcome. And then we need to give us some uh, two, two, three months because Christmas is Christmas time. We can't work. <laughs> the biostatisticians as well, you know. And then finally, in March, we are confident to have all the data analyzed and to have the conclusion of the data, and we will be able to submit the manuscript to a journal for publication. So hopefully, we will see the paper in this period. And this is how long it takes to do a randomized control clinical trial. I'm sorry, I don't be able to show you uh, some data now. But this is one of the first cases that I enrolled. And this lady, she had these three implants with perimplantitis. Uh, this, is, this, uh, this was uh, cemented, but I was able to decement. And I was able to unscrew the abutments that I put in an ultrasonic uh, uh, with um, 
uh, some disinfection uh, things. And then uh, why, while uh, the, the abutment were uh, cleaning, cleaned, uh, I raised the flap. After anesthesia, of course, this is the buccal flap. And you see, honestly, I'm a perio. And I love, I always say, when I put my scalpel into the tissue, the tissue needs to be like this. I want to have the non-surgical completed nicely, etc. I don't like to put my scalp in granulation tissue. But when you work on periimplantitis, you always do. And this is the part I don't like of this surgery. And so you have a little bit more bleeding. That's what I see in perio, for example. And, uh, and then we raise also the lingual part. And you see there is some granulation tissue attached to the flap. So we remove that with the scalpel to have a clean uh, surface of the, of the flap. Now we can start to work on our uh, granulation tissue with the laser and, uh, and with the water. And it's very nice to see how the granulation tissue is removed. Uh, you can help yourself with uh, some forceps, but uh, it's not two seconds, you know, you need to work. It's, it requires a little bit of time, but uh, he will die very, in a very clean way. And then you remove all the granulation tissue, and now you can work on your uh, implant surface, and you can use the second tip with the different setting to clean the implant surface. And now uh, I always close my uh, abutment uh, with uh, this tube with the uh, silver plug. It's a device uh, with uh, a, a little, very little percentage of silver. It's like, it's like a plastic material that uh, like when you are on the plane and you put this. It's like a cork, let's say. And uh, it's a cork with a small percentage, very small of silver that is biocompatible. And uh, you know silver doesn't allow to the uh, to, to, to the bacteria to stay. And uh, when you remove all the, all the amalgams below, you find very hard, right? Because the silver is not good to see, but kills the bacteria. The old Romans used to use uh, silver balls into the water to keep the water uh, sterile. And the king it with the silver forks and knife, right? Not gold. So what kind of king is? The king should use the gold one. No, he used the silver one because the silver uh, kills the bacteria. The gold doesn't. And uh, so I always like to do so it's easy to place and easy to remove. And then I, I close it with composite, OK? I'm very good in using composite, as you can see. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I made uh, like uh, three holes in the membrane. So I will use it as a punch uh, to, to, to place in. Uh, in position, now I can put, put my BIOS collagen under and, and I can stabilize my membrane epically and then I can advance the flap coronally and close as bad as possible. This is the uh, test uh, side and this is the control side. You know, a lot of, now when you go to meetings, implant meetings, they will tell you, if the tissue is thick, it's okay. It's not true. You can have inflammation when the tissue is thick. Of course, it's not nice to have very thin. But when you have thick tissue, I mean, this, this implant doesn't have perimplantitis. This implant has, <laughs> for example. OK? Uh, this patient was uh, uh, randomized a, as a control case. So we raised our flap. And we removed the granulation tissue as the old uh, fashion technique. And uh, so try to clean as better as possible. And now we use this titanium brush to remove all the, to clean the implant surface as better as possible. You can see, uh, this is easy. That's why you took the photo here. But to take the photo here, <laughs> it's much more difficult, okay? You have to clean 360 degrees because the peri-implant disease is it's always circumferential disease. It's not like in peri or you can have a defect one side and the other side is perfect. The imperi implantitis is always like a cup and always goes to the same threads all around. That's why you need to open uh, buccal and lingual flaps. And, uh, and so this is the, uh, when you finalize your cleaning, 
And after everything is done, you go with the air uh, power uh, erythritol powder on the, on the surface of the implant contaminated, and you place your graft. Now I have a series of photos that you, Alfonso, should show. These photos are taken at the microscopic uh, SEM uh, from uh, Alfonso. And um, this is the big magnification, as I was telling you. This is the uh, TU Knight surface, original, and this is after you go with laser. You see, the surface is significantly uh, modified. And uh, as you can see, a uh, higher magnification. Uh, but this is the good part. I mean, this is will uh, uh, vaporize, let's say, the, the, the layer outside and will uh, allow to, the, uh, to this part of the titanium to bio, be biocompatible <laughs> for the healing. I, w I will not tell you, will Reos integrate? We don't know. We need an histological study to see that. But at least will be biocompatible to have a good healing. And these are some slides of the same uh, style, let's say. So you can see the surface modified by the laser. There are beautiful images taken by Alfonso. As you can see here, this is the titanium surface, uh, uh, I mean, etched by the laser approach. And um, with this, I can uh, say that uh, it's very important to spend the proper time to clean all the surface, to see properly, to open nice flap, and to be able to close. So set the proper time to do this. And uh, in summary, we can say that there is no gold standard for treatment of perimplantitis still. Uh, each one will tell you his own recipe, but no one will tell you I have evidence to prove that. And we know that it's easier to treat perimplantitis, as shown by Thor Bankerloom, for example, with uh, uh, machined implants. But those are the very old implants, and they are machined. So if you have, you have less perimplantitis in machined implants, and uh, in the, so I really don't know why today we don't have machined implants. <laughs> because the only issue about machined implants is that it takes a little bit more time before to go to the prosthetic phase. But uh, then you have less perimplantitis, and you cannot uh, where uh, if uh, you have some risk, higher risk to lose the implant in the early phase. But if I have to lose an implant, I prefer to lose the implant immediately. It's better to lose an implant after one or two months than after two, three years, right? So, but there are not basically uh, machined uh, uh, implants today on the market. By the way, if you have perimplantitis on a machine implant, it's easier to be treated, but with uh, rough surfaces is more difficult. There is no gold standard, and there is weak evidence in terms of randomized control clinical trial. But there is a lot of evidence about laser treatment on perimplantitis. But are all case series, case report, uh, or uh, uh, reviews, or uh, studies that analyze like uh, histology, etc. And uh, uh, there are many of these evidence. This is not randomized controlled. Is, uh, is actually very good and shows amazing cases. But we want to know how many times this happens. It happens one time in a while, or it happens in a cost, constant way. That's why I approach the uh, procedure with the laser. And uh, I got very good personal feeling, and uh, honestly. And so that's why, together with uh, my friend Alfonso, we designed to design this randomized control, control clinical trial that is still in progress. Unfortunately, I cannot show you the results, but I hope Morita will invite me to the next Europeo and we show you the data published. And with this, I'd like to thank you. Thank you.